We are continuing today our uh, mini-series in the Gospel of Mark that Dan kicked off last week. Mark, uh, the author of uh, the Gospel of Mark, was probably on the edge of the crowds that followed Jesus. Most scholars think that in chapter 14, he is the young man who is there, uh, wrapped in a robe in the... um, uh, Eve in the night in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus is arrested just before he is taken to be crucified and he's the young man there who then flees naked from the scene. And um, we know that, however, after that he didn't um, end in disaster. He then went on to be the traveling companion of Peter, of uh, the Apostle Paul and of Barnabas. And as they preached the good news about Jesus, Mark wrote it down, which is why when we read his account, it reads at breakneck speed. It reads like a preacher. So uh, there in chapter one, uh, Mark deals with the baptism of Jesus in just three verses. He deals with the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness in just two verses. And then we get to our reading today when Mark describes the start of Jesus's public ministry. And we get to read the very first words out of Jesus's mouth in his ministry. And how we start matters, because first impressions count. Years ago, I was going through the selection process to see whether or not the Anglican church thought they should train me for the priesthood. And it got to the part in the selection process when I had to go and be interviewed by the bishop. And I had never met this particular bishop before, so I wanted to make a good impression. So I dressed very smartly, I went round to his house, he gave me a cup of tea, and we began to chat. And not long into the conversation, I suddenly heard this strange purring sound. It was like a brrrr sound. And I must have looked slightly startled, Because he said to me, oh, don't worry, I have a very rare heart condition. So I have to wear this particular type of pacemaker, and every now and again it makes that sound. So I I thought, okay, fine. And we continued to chat. At the end of the interview, he was showing me out of his house. He opened the front door, and there were steps like this up to his front door. So I was saying goodbye to him and about to step down the steps to go. And I was thinking, do you know what, Miles? It's gone really well. You've made a good first impression. And as I was saying goodbye, I heard the sound again. So I thought nothing of it, and I stepped backwards. And as I did, I suddenly heard this yelping sound. And my foot seemed to just move from underneath me, and I fell backwards down the steps and landed on my back on his drive with my feet in the air. Now, what had happened? Well, that second purring sound was not his pacemaker, but his pet cat, (laughs) which I had just trodden and slipped on, injuring the cat and myself in the process. Now, thankfully, the cat recovered, even if my reputation never did. I later found out that from that point onwards, whenever they talked about me in the diocese, they simply referred to me as Catman. (laughs) Hardly the superhero you grow up wanting to be, Catman. But the name stuck. Why? Because first impressions count. So here we read how Jesus starts his first words. So let's read them. This is Mark chapter 1, beginning at verse 14. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he'd gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. 
Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The very first words of Jesus in his ministry were these. The time has come. Or the literal translation is, the time is fulfilled. There are two words for time in Koine Greek, the language in which Mark was writing. One word for time is chronos, chronological time. The second word is kairos. And kairos means a moment in time. A history-changing, epoch-making, kingdom-inbreaking moment in time. And here, Jesus is saying, the kairos has come. Because not all time is of equal value. Mark hints at this at the very start of his account. In verse 1, he writes, the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ. Here, he is making a direct, intentional parallel with the very first words of the Bible. At the start of Genesis, Writing about creation, it says, in the beginning. And here, Mark is saying, a new beginning is breaking into the world. And he emphasizes this point further by referring to the gospel. Now, as you probably know, the word gospel means good news. And the word for gospel, again, in the Koine Greek in which Mark is writing, is Evangelion, And that's a very loaded term, euangelion. Why? Because it was a word that was used in the Greco-Roman world to announce an important historical event. So, for example, when Caesar Augustus had been born, it was announced throughout the whole known world as gospel, euangelion. And here, Mark is saying, A new king, a king even greater than Caesar, has come. This is good news. And what is this Kairos fulfilling history and world changing good news? Well, Jesus says, the kingdom of God has come near with the coming of Jesus himself. The uh, biblical narrative begins in Genesis with the first humans, Adam and Eve. And you probably know the story, how they reject and turn away from God. They sin. And in so doing, they hand the world over to Satan. But God graciously unleashed a salvation plan for all humanity to win the world back for him and for us. And God's kingdom with the coming of Jesus has re-entered the world. It's broken in now and it's advancing again. The centuries of waiting are over, Jesus is saying. With the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, God's kingdom has broken in and is on the move. And by kingdom of God, of course, we mean the rule and reign of Jesus. Not in a geographical sense, but in the heart and minds of people. For kingdom of God, think rule, not realm. And Jesus is both the message and the messenger. He's the content and the carrier of this good news. So this morning, I want us to ask this question. What are the implications for you and me today, right now, of these first words of Jesus. Well, the first thing I believe we see is this. Seize the power of now. Seize the power of now. The kingdom is now. You know, the greatest gift that the world was ever given was Jesus. And what did we do with that gift? We crucified him between two thieves. But today, right now, 
is also a gift from God. You know, scripture says, new are your mercies every morning, O Lord. Today is the day that the Lord has made. And the, the danger is that we can take this gift of today and we can also crucify it between two thieves called yesterday and tomorrow. For some of us here today, maybe it's like the power and the joy of today is stolen by yesterday. Maybe the hurt that you carry or the regrets or the consequences of yesterday feel like they define you. Or perhaps it's the success of yesterday that actually entraps you today. Do you remember when? Those were the days. The Spirit of God really moved back then, if only. But then we miss what God is doing today. Or perhaps for you, it's that the power of today is stolen by tomorrow. Oh, I, I know I need to forgive that person, for example, or I know that I need to make and face that tough decision, or I, I know I need to do what is right to commit to that relationship, to break that habit, to get my walk with God right. But first, I'll do so-and-so. I'll do it tomorrow. But tomorrow never comes, and we remain trapped. A Kairos moment is significant, but throughout Scripture, what we see is that every moment can be an in-breaking, breakthrough, Kairos moment with Jesus. So why not make today Right now, a Kairos moment for you. And there's an urgency to this, because you see, these words of Jesus demand action. And we see it in the following verses in how Jesus calls the first disciples. He sees Simon Peter and his brother Andrew fishing. And what does he do? He goes up to them, he uh, lays out the mission, he explains the strategy, he debates the pros and cons of following him, gives them a draft job description, and begins to dialogue about remuneration. No, he doesn't do any of that, does he? He doesn't do any of that. No, what he does is he looks at them and he simply says, hey, come follow me. And they do. That's the remarkable thing. Not that he chooses fishermen, but that they follow him. Then he, well, it says in verse 18, at once they left their nets and followed him. At once. This is a favorite phrase of Mark. In the Koine Greek, it's kai euthos. And immediately, at once, without delay, he uses it again and again as Jesus encounters people. Then he sees James and John, brothers, preparing their nets with their father Zebedee. What does he say to them? He doesn't even say, come follow me. He just goes, oi. And they leave everything. And it says, without delay, kaiuthos in the Greek, they follow him. Do you know, I just wonder whether if we're here today, and I, I don't know your circumstances, but we all face challenges in, li in life. If you feel stuck, if you feel trapped, powerless in your situation, maybe even afraid, perhaps Jesus is saying to you right now, hey, Kaiuthos. It's now. The power is now. You can trust me. I'll set you free. 
Let's go. Game time. You know, the um, Emily who uh, worships here, uh, she and uh, Henrik have given me permission to tell their story. So Emily was praying in um, the, our prayer room just round behind uh, the cafe there during one of our 24-7 weeks of prayer. And as she was praying, she got this sense of urgency that the time was now, that she wanted to do something for the Lord there and then, r- right now, just as she was praying. So after she'd finished her slot in the prayer room, she went down onto Bukibintang, and she saw this young man there who was looking uh, a bit lost. So she went up to him and said, hi, are you lost? And he said, I don't think so. And, um, but he was new to KL. Henrik was new to KL. So she said, do you know anybody here? He said, not really. And being a sort of roughly the same age as some of her kids, she said, well, do you want to come and play futsal with my family? And he went, uh, okay. So they went and played futsal. And then after that, she said, do you go to church? He said, no. She said, would you like to? He said, when? She said, Sunday. He went, uh, okay. <laughs> so he came here that next Sunday. He sat down. I happened to be talking about Alpha because the next round of Alpha was about to begin here. She turned to him and said, Henrik, do you want to come to Alpha? And he went, uh, okay. So he came on Wednesday to Alpha. He came every week. And he's been here serving at HTBB ever since. Both Emily and Henrik grasped the power of now, that the kingdom of God is now that today can be a Kairos moment for you. And by the way, if you have friends that you think you'd love to invite to Alpha, our next run of Alpha begins here on the 2nd of March, uh, just after Chinese New Year. We're beginning 7 p.m. Wednesday, the 2nd of March here. They're most welcome. And then collectively as a church, how, how are we going to seize the power of now? Well, I'm really excited to say that one thing we're going to do is we're going to start another morning service. We're going to start a 9.30 service here on Sunday, the 6th of March. The 6th of March. And the way we're going to do it is a little bit differently. For the 9.30, at the back area there, we're going to set up a little cafe so that you can come at 9 o'clock. You can get your coffee or your tea. You can get your breakfast. Uh, eat it, and then we'll start at 9.30. But to make this happen, we need team. In particular, we need help with the children's groups, CHTBB volunteers, and we need cafe team. So if you think that you'd like to be a part of that, maybe explore being on team, or if you just want to think, well, shall I make this my service? Then today, at 1 p.m. after this service, in the youth room behind the cafe, um, come along at 1 I'm just going to share the vision. You can ask your questions and see if this is for you. But we can seize the power of now. Secondly, we see from these words of Jesus that we need to make Jesus our king. Make Jesus your king. Don't delay. You know, the first half of Mark's gospel is all about miracles and power. Jesus goes around, he preaches the good news, he heals the sick, he sets the oppressed free, he does miracles pew, 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 everywhere. It's all power. And that's the first half of the gospel. And it culminates in chapter 8, where Peter, he asks them, who, who did the crowd, because the crowds are now talking about Jesus. He asks them, who did they say I am? And then he asked the disciples, who do you say I am? And Peter confesses Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God. Then the next chapter, chapter 9, we get a glimpse of Jesus' glory as he's transfigured, as he sort of glows momentarily on the mountaintop. That's the first half of the gospel. It's all about power. And maybe if you haven't done the same as Peter... If you haven't made Jesus Lord of your life, then maybe you'd like to do that 
today, now. You know, Jesus, it says in Scripture, stands at the door and knocks. And maybe you've opened the door of your heart and you've let Jesus into the hallway. But Jesus doesn't want to be Lord of your hallway. (laughs) He wants to be Lord of your life, the whole of you, not a compartment of you. And the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, is a gentleman. He's not going to barge his way in. But he's waiting for you to say, I want you to be Lord of every part of my life. Maybe right now he's looking at the living area in your house and your, or your condo. And you're thinking, uh, not in there, Lord. I, I, you know, I've got a complicated family. Chinese New Year's coming up. You know, lots of dynamics going on there. Let's wait until the new year, shall we? But no, he wants to be Lord of that part of your life. Or maybe he's looking over to the door where you do your work or your study on the the desk there. And you're thinking, well, no, no, Lord, not not my job. You know, the politics at work and it's, you know, it's dog eat dog. Don't want you in there. But he wants to be Lord of your work life. He's interested in it. It has significance in his eyes. Or maybe he's looking over to the bedroom door and you're going, Lord, you're definitely not going in there. But you can invite him in. Open every door. Because if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. Jun has given me permission to tell you his story. A friend invited him along here to church. He loved it. He came again. He went out for lunch with Dan. And Dan said, so have you made Jesus Lord of your life? He goes, what does that mean? Uh, And he says, well, have you chosen to follow Jesus, become a Christian? He said, no. So Dan said, would you like to? He went, yeah, I would. Dan said, now? He said, yeah, okay. So they prayed. Then he got stuck into the life of the church immediately. Within a couple of weeks, he was singing in the choir at the carols by candlelight service that we did here. Singing about the glory and lordship of Jesus. He didn't delay. Don't put it off. As C.S. Lewis once said, there's no use saying you'll bow when you can no longer stand. Coming up on the 20th, Sunday, the 28th of February, it's our next baptisms. If you've never been baptized, maybe you can seize that opportunity. Just come and tell us. and We'd love to baptize you. Maybe you've been putting it off for a while. But you can, and pardon the pun, take the plunge on the 28th of February. Make Jesus king of your life. You can pray, Lord, your will be done in my life. And the will of God is always a far bigger thing than we bargain for. But God always gives his best to those who leave the choice with him. Make him your king. And then thirdly, I believe the Lord would say this. We need to understand that God doesn't cause suffering, but he can certainly work through it. In Jeremiah chapter 10 in the Old Testament, it declares God as king of the nations. And yet in Zechariah 14, it prophesies that there will come a day when all the nations acknowledge him as their king. In other words, the kingdom of God, the rule and reign of Jesus in the hearts and minds of people, the kingdom of God is both now and not yet. It's now, but it's not here in its fullness and won't be here in its fullness and completed until Jesus returns at the end of time. And today we live with that tension of the now and the not yet of the kingdom. 
if the first half of Mark's gospel is all about the power of Jesus' ministry, it's about power, the second half, after chapters 8 and 9, is then all about the passion, which is the phrase we use to describe Jesus' journey to the cross and suffering. You know, in the Old Testament times, the people of Israel, they understood that there would come one day a powerful Davidic king who would liberate the people, a powerful king. But they also had prophecies that there would be a suffering servant who would die and suffer on behalf of the people. But they didn't realize that the two, the powerful king and the suffering servant, would be fulfilled in the one person, the person of Jesus. And likewise, discipleship is both powerful victory and suffering. It's both power and taking up our cross. And Jesus may not cause your suffering, and your suffering may not last, but he can certainly work through it to grow us into his likeness. Just as God worked through the suffering of Jesus to save the world and win it back. So if when you heard me talk about the power of now, if that grated with you, because you are desperate today. You so want that breakthrough, but it's just not been forthcoming. You're still waiting. You're still suffering. Then I really want you to know this. It doesn't mean that God's hand and blessing has left you, nor that it'll always be like this. But it means he's with you. And he will work in and through this time of suffering. I read recently about Jim Elliot. He, uh, aged 28, got married and went off with some companions to be a missionary in Ecuador. And he and four other guys, they went one day deep into the jungle to try and find a completely unreached tribe called the Wadoni. And they found them and they began to share the good news. And at first, they accepted Jim and his companions. But then, sadly, when he was still 28 years old, on the 8th of January 1956, the Wadoni killed Jim Elliott and his friends. His uh, young wife, not long afterwards, found Jim Elliott's journal. And in it, she read these words that he'd written. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Now, not many of us are called to suffer with our lives like that. But discipleship involves victory and suffering. And how do we hold these two in tension? Well, the words of Jesus right at the start here of his ministry. He says, repent and believe. Now, this word believe is significant because belief is more than just uh, credence or consent. It's active. The word there for believe literally means trust. You know, in a certain world, when we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, we don't know what's going to happen today. That's why people are looking for predictions. That's why they love fortune telling and things like that, to try and minimize the risk, to somehow get control through insider knowledge. We want predictions. But God doesn't give us predictions. He gives you and me promises. And a promise is more important than a prediction. When God speaks, a prediction becomes a promise, and it will come to pass. And what Jesus is saying here with these opening words are, are you going to believe my promises? 
Are you going to trust me? And I suppose if you summarize everything that I really want to say to us today, it's this. You know, some of us today, you're suffering, and what you really need to know is God understands, He loves you, He's with you, and your suffering does not invalidate you as a disciple of Jesus. But He may also just want you to hear this message today. Trust me. This is your Kairos moment. The kingdom of God is at hand. Today can be breakthrough. Seize the power of now. Amen. Shall we? Would you like to stand?